uh, thanks everybody. And, and, and thanks to the Imperva folks for putting this together. Um, except Brian and I are, 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 are friends and, and colleagues and we, we sought uh, an opportunity to kind of collaborate and do something together. Uh, my name is Adam Prem. I'm with ServiceNow. I've been with ServiceNow for going on four years. I specifically um, handle uh, U.S. federal, specifically Navy and Marine Corps accounts um, for ServiceNow. Um, and so that is my background. So I, we've, you know, we, we're going to talk a lot about sort of compliance and, and risk and, and how that integrates with the change control process within ServiceNow. But, um, you know, this has applications with the DOD, uh, with the federal space, but certainly far outside that as well in commercial environments. So I'm, I'm happy to be here today. And thanks for joining, Adam. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Brian Anderson. I've been with Imperva for about uh, nine years. I'm a director of technology. I work in the office of the CTO here on various uh, innovation initiatives and, uh, and product strategy initiatives and so forth. I um, spent a good amount of time uh, in the field working with large customers on the West Coast. And um, by trade, I'm a software engineer, but really enjoyed, you know, working on different integrations and automation initiatives. So happy to talk about uh, some of these topics with you, with you guys this morning. And again, thanks for joining, Adam. Appreciate it. Um, so let's let's dive into it. Can you guys see my screen okay? Good here, Brian. Awesome. Very good. Adam, you want to talk us through some of the uh, the ServiceNow um, kind of overviews? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're going to cover four main sort of use cases today, and we'll go through them one at a time here. Change control reconciliation. So um, uh, ServiceNow has a wealth of capabilities. Uh, we, we're not going to dive into all of them, um, but uh, you know, we're going to focus mostly on IT service management today. So when you think about ITSM uh, from a ServiceNow perspective, you're thinking about things that a service desk would, would be taking care of, right? Incident, problem, changes, requests, release, those types of things from its users. And a big part of that is the change control environment from the uh, perspective of uh, you know, what's changing on the network. We have to automate the, the change process. We have to apply certain risks and controls whenever things do change. And so that's what ServiceNow brings uh, from an automation perspective. You know, we have the ability to, for example, uh, you know, when you think about ServiceNow, we're, we're a workflow automation company when you distill it all down. And so when you think about the change control process, you have sort of predictable, repeatable changes, but you also have emergency changes. You have standard and normal changes. So there's workflows associated with all of those. Um, and, and so the, the, to be able to reconcile sort of the data and the changes that we're doing, um, you know, this is where you know, we're taking in a perva. Uh, information. Uh, from a security and compliance perspective, you know, we're talking about uh, Sarbanes-Oxley as one specific change control or, or, or security and compliance um, uh, vector, but, you know, when I, I come from the federal space, we're also thinking about things like risk management frameworks or, or, or fire compliance. So any sort of security and controls that are, uh, you know, brought through Imperva and those data feeds can come into service now and sort of enrich those uh, security incidents or changes or whatever we need to, uh, whatever we're beholden to comply to. So from a continuous discovery standpoint, you know, one of the, I, I like to think of it as the central nervous system of ServiceNow is really the configuration management database, right? This is the holistic uh, database that controls all the configuration items on a network, whether that's an IP enabled device, or this could be a system or an application, uh, anything within that architecture. We have the ability to um, uh, to go out and discover these assets and these CIs, bring them back into the CMDB to keep them uh, sort of you know three main points: keep it, you know keep it visible, keep it healthy, and optimize it. And so uh, the integration with Imperva is going to is going to talk about a bit about how that works. And then the detection and remediation again, this is uh, this is more on the Imperva side of, of the house, but uh, you know from a from a from a sensor standpoint, that's not what ServiceNow is really focused on today, which is, you know, this is the, the goodness that Imperva brings, that, that, that sort of uh, real-time information and, and things that are happening on the network. So, Brian, you got to awesome. so, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, so Imperva's capabilities are, we have visibility into what's happening uh, with the database, what's happening with web applications, and um, where we would leverage the wealth of capabilities on the ServiceNow side is taking action and assignment and escalation and tying into the business process side of that. So, um, you know, bringing in the context of what change controls you have and applying that to what we're actually seeing at the database level. And the integration between the two of those really helps to optimize and streamline uh, the process for things like change control or things like uh, even automated um, alerts or incident management and so forth. Yeah, so the, the, the uh, reference... 
Yep. Yeah, Sorry. Go ahead. I would say this is a high level architecture um, of what uh, what the impervious solution looks like from a, from a, a deployment perspective. There's, you know, for the on-premise solutions, we have a, a manager or an MX as we call it, and then there's one or multiple gateways that are responsible for processing traffic. And this could be web application uh, traffic or it could be database traffic in this case. Um, and then there's an integration, there's that dotted line now uh, that you see there where uh, we're pulling and pushing information to and from the ServiceNow uh, hosted solution via a REST API. And so uh, very simple APIs that we have on the MX as well as simple APIs to use on the ServiceNow side, the combination of that where we push and pull that context really enables us to um, get the most out of both solutions in, in this case as it applies to things like change control or uh, tying the data together between those two systems there. Yeah, and so from a change control reconciliation standpoint, some of the things that we're going to see here is, you know, you think about uh, something that's being monitored, a database that's being monitored, when a, when a change happens, right, we can automatically trigger uh, through something, it's a native capability within service now called Flow Designer, uh, and this is how we, uh, this is how we build workflows and create the automation that our customers, uh, cr you know, crave. But um, uh, the, you know, what we're doing today is, uh, you know, triggering a change control record. It's going to look for a ticket ID. Uh, if it doesn't see one, uh, it's going to create one. But uh, this is this is where we sort of get into the the, the notion of okay, so something's been detected. And we're gonna we're gonna change. We're gonna create a change record. We're gonna see that on the ServiceNow side. And the tasking, as Brian put it, you know, the tasking is going to be done within uh, ServiceNow as far as what needs to happen and when and and uh, how quickly. Um, and here's just a couple screenshots that we have around um, how to configure the policies and uh, how that's going to work, but I'll walk through that in a live demo. Um, and also an example of what it looks like to assign a ticket uh, whenever you log in as a database administrator to manage you know, or, or update a database schema and what that looks like from an audit perspective. But we'll show that to you live here in just a moment. Um, and lastly, here's just kind of a, a touch on you know, why this is important is, um, you know, from an audit perspective, there's a lot of compliance, regulatory compliance requirements that we need to adhere to. So typically you have like a quarterly or annual audit that you have to go through, that being SOX or, you know, PCI or HIPAA or uh, whatever other standards that you have to adhere to. Um, and typically, like, if it's an external auditor that comes in, they look at uh, a ticket that happened eight months ago, and they say, show me how you followed the process for this particular ticket, and they pull it out of the stack. And so you have to go then uh, see which assets that ticket was uh, associated with and then go to those logs at that particular time and try to pull up all the queries that uh, were run at that time to prove that you can report on and you can comply with what these requirements are. And so this integration that we're going to talk through today really helps to streamline that process. And these are some of the regulatory uh, requirements that they, would, that they would tie back to. Uh, so let's jump, let's jump into a demo here. Um, I have uh, a demo instance of, uh, of ServiceNow that, um, that Adam was kind enough to stand up for us, and I have a, an MX or a manager that we're going to walk through. Um, so I just want to walk through like a day in the life here of you know, creating a change control um, in the ServiceNow system. And so maybe my change control that I have set up here is uh, I want to go create one to update a database schema, for example. And so in here I could say we're going to um, – Let's go ahead and create a new one of these. And maybe we're going to update a database schema, for example. So in here I'll say, I want to do this in a staging environment, or maybe I want to do this in production. So we're going to say update in prod um, 002, maybe that's the name of the server, for example. Um, and what I want to do is give a little description here about the instructions of what you're supposed to be doing. So let's say, go update this database on some MySQL server in this example. And uh, maybe what I want to do is I want to assign this to the database San Diego group. And in this case, what we're doing, and we'll talk through this in a minute, but we're pulling in all the change control tickets uh, that are assigned to a specific group. There may be a lot of tickets in the system, and I don't necessarily want to pull every single one of those into the MX, so we can actually assign filters to what we want to pull in. And maybe we'll only apply, um, we only want to pull tickets in that are assigned to this particular group, and we only want to apply or pull in tickets that uh, are during an active change window. And so um, we really just want that limited set that's the, the ones that are relevant to us. And here's our change number, uh, this, this 32 number that we're going to be looking at. So let's go ahead and submit this. And I now have a, a ticket to, um, you know, to, uh, to work with here. Um, I should be getting an email shortly uh, you know, that says, hey, you know, DBA, your, uh, your ticket has been created. Uh, it's assigned to you. Please go execute this. And so, um, you know, because ServiceNow has the ability to do notifications like that. So once I receive this as a DBA, maybe what I do is I log into um, my database here. But 
actually, the first thing I want to do is um, let's go ahead and check out uh, in the MX here uh, a list of those change control tickets that, uh, that we're going to pull in. So the, the way that we tie this together is uh, there is a notion of data sets. Under setup global objects, data sets is a list of you know, dynamic attributes that you can use to, uh, for policy definition or a variety of other things. And so right now, I don't have that, uh, that latest change control ticket pulled into the MX yet. We'll notice that it was the 32 is the number that we're looking for. Uh, let's jump over to, um, to our MX. And this, this is something that could, be, that could be running on a cron. Um, I have in this uh, directory on the MX, there is, um, let me go to, oh wait, hold on a second here. In the var user folder on the MX, we have uh, this is the folder that you would drop any custom script that you're going to be running. And uh, when you do run a custom script from this folder, this will survive upgrades and it will survive patches. And that's, that's kind of why, uh, why we run it from here. So what you could do is set up a cron job that will um, have this running every, you know, every few minutes or whatever and pull in your latest ticket IDs, right? So what we're doing is this, is, this runs in the background. It pulled in all of the, the latest ticket IDs. And if I click on this again here, I should see my 32 uh, number pop in. This is the change control that we just created. So now the MX knows about that. Um, what I want to do is I want to log into my database and uh, let's go ahead and execute a query here. So let me, ju let me jump out of that and I will log into the database here. If I could type the uh, password correctly here. I'm going to use the test database in this particular case. And what I want to do is I'm going to follow the instructions of the change control, and I'm going to try to update a particular table. So let me go ahead and drop that table. And notice that I've been disconnected. The reason that I'm disconnected is because I didn't have a, um, a valid ticket ID. And I, if I go into the MX here, I can see that there was an alert that was created. And the reason that there's three is that the MySQL client will automatically try to reconnect three times. So it blocked all of those because... Um, I, I was not able to, um, I didn't have a valid ticket ID. So I have a security policy set up to enforce or block or restrict anybody from, uh, from making those changes unless you have a valid ticket ID. The valid ticket ID is um, that 32 number. And the way this works with, database, uh, with databases is there's a benign query that you can run. So select whatever the ticket ID as set ticket ID from dual. Uh, the reason that, um, or the way that databases work is you have the ability to run this ticket query for this very purpose because change controls have to happen. They're typically tied to a valid change control number. And so what you would do is you have to go back in the database audit and find this. What Imperva has the ability to do is tie this down to every other query that I run for the remainder of this session. And so um, what I could do now is go ahead and drop that table. And then I can uh, go ahead and create a new table and insert some records in there. And you'll notice that now this worked. Okay, great. So uh, the interesting part about that is um, if we go down to our audit and I look at the last, and this is under uh, database audit data, and I hit update here, let's take a look at the audit data that we have. You'll notice that there was a drop table uh, that was blocked, uh, but then there's a variety of other queries that, that actually happened successfully here, and I have this ticket number that's tied directly to that. So the use case here is, or the, or the value proposition is, when the auditor comes in and says, hey, show me that you followed your process for uh, change control 0032, I can now create a filter for this, and here's my report. Here's everything that I did tied back to that ticket. So that's great, and that saves a lot of time. And the enforcement capability that we have really restricts anybody from making changes to the database unless you have a valid ticket ID that came directly from that system. Uh, that's great, but let's take this a step further. Um, let's say that I'm on the ServiceNow side, and I don't know if I go back to this change control, really what happened with this, with this uh, change control ticket yet, because I don't have access to the audit data. I would need to get access to this, this system and this audit data to see what really happened. Um, so let's jump into uh, the reporting component here. And we really tried to close the loop on this and push this data back into ServiceNow. So what I'm going to do is run a report. Uh, this is called Change Control Audit Report. And uh, I can run this, maybe schedule it for every hour, and I run it as a CSV. Um, and I can assign a followed action here to say I'm going to push all this data back into ServiceNow based on the change ticket ID number. So when I run this, uh, I have a followed action that's going to take that, parse it, and push that back into ServiceNow. So I should be able to go, uh, whenever this job completes, 
take all this audit data and jump into the notes here and see that all of my queries that I just ran at the database level are directly tied back into the change control right inside of ServiceNow in the UI. And so that's something that can be automated. Again, the, the ingestion of pulling in the ticket IDs into the MX is a job that runs as a cron, for example, every few minutes. So whenever I do create a, a change control on this side of the house, that's automatically brought into the MX. And then as soon as I'm finished with my change control, a scheduled report can push that back in here, closing the loop. So that's kind of a high-level overview of, you know, of how these things can really tie together between, uh, between the, the workflow of creating and managing um, you know, change controls on the ServiceNow side, as well as uh, closing the loop on the audit data that pulls in there. Um, and to go back to the alert that we had here, there is a missing ticket ID. Um, if I go to this policy, it's possible whenever this, uh, this, an incident like this happens, that you know, DBA tries to run a privileged operation against the database without, um, you know, without a valid ticket, we can, we can also create incidents based off of that. So if we go back to this incident screen here, uh, let's take a look at the alert. The alert ID here is 8002, and I put the name of that directly into uh, the name of this incident. So here is an incident that was created inside of ServiceNow alerting now with a workflow and assignment and escalation tied to that saying, hey, by the way, somebody tried to drop a table in production and they weren't supposed to and they had a missing ticket ID. So now I have, again, visibility and management of uh, of incidents that are like that um, where somebody tried to do something that they didn't follow the process and uh, something, you know, happened in production that, that should not have happened. So that's really the ability to close the loop on that. Um, so I know, I know we've covered quite a bit of information here. I wanted to just pause for a minute and see if anybody had any uh, thoughts or questions so far about what we've shared. Hey, Brian. Uh, so mm -hmm. Jim mentions, he said, I missed the part uh, that prevents the change from taking place without uh, SN change. Could you repeat that part or explain if SSMS were the source of the change? Absolutely. So um, let me just jump into our security policies here. We have um, uh, database service custom policies. Um, there is a configuration here that we can put in place to say, um, if I don't have a valid ticket, or if I have, if I don't have a ticket at all, I can take an action of blocking. Uh, this is a under policies uh, security. There is a database security policy you can create that, if you look at the predicates or match criteria here, saying if I if I uh, execute a privileged operation in this particular case, is what we're looking for, and I have a ticket, and it's not a part of my ticket IDs from ServiceNow, meaning I just put in some random ticket that's not legitimate, or if I don't have a ticket at all in this particular case, if I'm trying to execute a privileged operation in this case, and I don't have a ticket at all, I want to block that. And so these are the two policies you could put in place to enable enforcement to force DBAs to follow that process. Now, you don't have to start off with blocking and enforcement. You could just do alerting and say anytime somebody drops a table in production, for example, and you don't have a valid ticket ID, you want to know about that. And so they, in, in the world of DBAs, they call it like the wall of shame. If I run a report for any DBA that had a privileged operation that didn't have a ticket tied to it, we got to talk about that. And so they have, you know, the scheduled job. It's like, all right, who's on the list this week, guys? Yeah, who, let's, let's all follow the process here. But if you don't follow that, this is a great way to um, potentially enforce this or just get immediate visibility into uh, folks on the team that don't necessarily follow the process, which we should be always following that process, uh, you know, it, because we get audited and it's a, it's a huge pain to have to deal with from uh, managing that. So there's the relationship of, uh, you know, audit and security and so forth with, uh, with the DBA group. But that's, you know, th this is a, a way to get visibility. Hope that, hope that answered the question there. Um, there's no other questions, Brian, so. Okay, so one other thing I wanted to talk through here is, um, you know, another use case that we talked about is the integration around, um, uh, around the CMDB within ServiceNow. So ServiceNow can, uh, through continuous discovery, um, you know, locate all of your assets within an environment. And so part of that may be that they have uh, visibility to what databases are created. And maybe there's change controls to stand up a database server. And so if, if that's the case and the database server has uh, sensitive data, or is a business critical application, you would want auditing to be tied to that. So we can, you know, we can help automate the deployment and provisioning of, you know, of agents or, or uh, audit configurations tied to that. Uh, but also there's this notion of um, assessing your environment. Uh, under the database assessment scans and database assessment policies, Imperva has the ability to run 
assessment scans against your database to tell whether or not it's a, you know if there's a missing configuration, if there's default passwords, if there are vulnerabilities that are known uh, on those database servers. We want to be aware of what our uh, of what those vulnerabilities are. So under the risk management console here, we have the ability to kind of run that, and we have this information now. Uh, what do we do with this information? We need to give this to somebody to take action, right? So there, this is where we can involve. Uh, the process management automation that uh, ServiceNow brings to the table. Uh, what I can do is come back over to our report screen here. Um, under managing reports, I can run a report to output all this vulnerability data. And uh, my vulnerability report here, I can also tie an action set to this. Uh, and this is in um, the folder that I shared with you, the VAR user data folder on the MX, that I can push this to um, – you know, to ServiceNow, for example. So uh, every single time I run this, uh, what that can do inside the ServiceNow system is create vulnerable items. And vulnerable items are tied back to configuration items, which is tied back to the CMDB. So all the data that we saw from me running a database assessment scan or a vulnerability scan is now passed into ServiceNow and has, again, workflow tied to that, escalation tied to that, and also maps the... Uh, um, you know, the next steps to fix it and whatever the CVE number is tied to these vulnerabilities as well. So you'll notice that this is a configuration item for uh, this particular uh, database server. If I, if I open up one of these, for example, all the information that we saw from the vulnerability scan on the MX is now present directly inside the ServiceNow system and has all the process management, automation, and assignment, and escalation, uh, and ultimately uh, remediation and tracking of that vulnerability, the life cycle of it, um, we now uh, put that back into a system that can, that can effectively manage that. So, uh, it, you know, visibility into the traffic and looking at what happens, looking at things that are vulnerable at the database level is something that Imperva does really well, but leveraging solutions that, uh, that really cater to managing that process from an automation perspective is where you can get the power between integrating systems like this. Okay, so that is kind of most of what we had prepared to share today. Um, is, there, is there any other thoughts or questions from the group around, um, around SecureSphere or the integration with ServiceNow that we can help uh, speak to? You know, the usual suspects, uh, Sabi and Bob and CJ, no questions? Oh, here we go. Jerome, awesome. So are there specific manuals on the Imperva website on how to set this up? That is a great question. I should have covered that. Under github.com slash Imperva, um, we have a variety of uh, open source packages that are up here, uh, SDKs and, and lots of scripts. Uh, there's also one called the MX Toolbox. And this is a, a repo that I created that has a bunch of different stuff in there, from performance monitoring to lots of different things. It's kind of a general purpose repo. You'll find a ServiceNow folder uh, in this repo that has – all the scripts to set this up, and each one of these are effectively documented. So from change control reconciliation, uh, there's a readme in here with screenshots and instructions specifically on how to set up each one of these for each step. Uh, That's a great question, by the way, and I should have covered that in the beginning, but here's where you'll find all the instructions for that. And I'll make sure to, uh, to add this link into a post on the community um, whenever, we, whenever we post it up there. But, yeah, we also put it in the chat there, the, in the chat there as well. Great. I, yeah, I just put it in the chat. And so CJ came through uh, with the question. So thanks again. So is use uh, API uh, update Imperva information? Is, uh, yeah, is use API update Imperva information? Does that make sense? So, um, so we have APIs that we leverage on both sides. Uh, so the APIs uh, on the MX, we use that API to ingest the, the ServiceNow change control tickets. We pull that in from the API from the ServiceNow side, if I understand the question correctly. Um, so we can uh, pull down the change control tickets and we update that data set on the Imperva side. And then uh, the other part of this is whenever a, an alert is created, whenever a security policy triggers, we then trigger an action set. In our terms, uh, an action set is taking an action whenever something happens, so you can have that be based off a variety of types of events. So in the case that a, an alert is generated because of security policy executed, you can pass all the parameters from that directly to the script every single time an alert is generated. And what we do, that script will then take that and format that into something that uh, ServiceNow is familiar with from their API format, and then it will then go either create an incident or create the vulnerable item in the, in the configuration item from the CMDB, or 
it will go back and update the notes uh, in that change control um, with all the audit data that's found from the reports that we run there. Uh, so that's how we leverage uh, both our, uh, the, the MX API as well as the ServiceNow API to update records on both sides of the equation there. Great. Yeah, well, and, and could I ask one more question? Because you use the sure. API to update all of things, but the mm -hmm. Intervast, the system even will show a lot of logging because you say like uh, you use the cron job to update all of things. So if like this way will be see in the interval system event will be a lot of logging, right? Uh, well, what we can do is your, your login, uh, we can cache that uh, local to the um, local to the system because you can use the same session ID to make multiple API calls and not have a bunch of login events. It's a great point, by the way. Maybe we should, uh, I should update a setting in there to say just use the local session ID so it only log in once. So what, what we can do is we can set it up to say, um, instead of logging in every single time the cron job runs, use a local session ID that's there so you don't have a bunch of system events that are flooded. Um, but that, that's a great call out and I can uh, work to make that update in there as well. Yep, thanks, thanks. Uh, that is mm -hmm. my only question. A great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Yep. Anything else from anyone? So just, uh, yes, there is. Uh, does this also flow into the data risk analytics tool? Uh, so data risk analytics um, will take all the audit data from our manager and it will ingest that and data risk analytics can then produce actionable insights saying, you know, here is of the billion events that we ingested today, here is, you know, 10 or 15 incidents that you should, that you should look at. Um, we can uh, work to set it up to where data risk analytics will feed those actionable incidents into ServiceNow as incidents. That would be one interesting integration. Um, the change control audit records really don't necessarily have a purpose to go into DRA or, or to data risk analytics. Data risk analytics uh, is uh, really kind of caters to ingesting a whole bunch of data and telling you what outlier queries there are, what kind of behavior in the environment um, should be analyzed or should be looked at from an a incident response or an anomaly detection perspective. So this integration around change controls is really tying the, the ticket number to the audit for the purpose of you know, streamlining going through that audit process of having to you know, reconcile which uh, queries are tied to what change control ticket number. And so um, the DRA component is kind of separate from that, but it would be interesting to look at sending incidents from DRA into ServiceNow so they have uh, a workflow tied to that and manage, uh, and manage that, um, uh, the life cycle of those incidents there. Interesting. And uh, so I don't you might close your ears on this one, but uh, for other vendors like BMC Software, uh, does the same uh, integration uh, exist or what could be some other alternatives? Right, so, uh, so the, if you go back to the global objects here, this data set can really be uh, from anywhere. In this particular case, we're pulling in from an API from ServiceNow, but we can also do this with an external query. Or if you had another system or another API, as long as there's uh, a way to pull that data in, um, there's no issue with bringing this data in from anywhere. So. Uh, that that is you know quote supported, um, but we have seen um, you know ServiceNow be a dominant vendor uh, in a lot of the customer environments that we work with. But sometimes there's a roll your own situation where they have proprietary or um, other you know like remedies or whatever in the environment, and those things can be supported as well. Cool. Um, as we wait quickly just for other questions, if there are any, um, we're certainly looking at doing more webinars with like these. Um, but I also need your ideas. I mean, we have some data around what we uh, think we should do. Uh, so just feel free to post that in, in, in the um, chat. We do have another question. Um, is there a user that is creating many alerts from this because they do not insert the change ticket number? Would that be something that is sent to DRA to show us uh, a user that is constantly violating this policy? Um, so if there are uh, if there are users that are doing things like dropping tables on a particular database in production, um, you know, what DRA will show you is that typically this behavior doesn't happen and then something did happen. I don't know that DRA really ties to the uh, security policies that you've created. Uh, what DRA is originally intended for is looking for 
uh, operations that that require investigation uh, because maybe it's like excessive record access or maybe it's something that uh, you know usually um, you know this user doesn't do that or usually you know this kind of behavior isn't seen as they pull anomalies out of out of audit data in that way so DRA doesn't really look at the security incidents that you have um, if there is a user that uh, that tries to run you know, queries like this dropping tables on a database that they shouldn't, where you have your security policy configured to alert or potentially block uh, some of that, you know, that would be something that those incidents that are created there uh, would be how you would, how you would effectively help and manage that. So um, DRA would be able to identify uh, some of the behavior, but it wouldn't necessarily tie back to the change control process or saying that this should have an ID when it doesn't. That's really something that um, I think that this integration and these other security policies that we have would help to uh, shine a light on operations that are performed against databases that uh, aren't intended to have those kinds of uh, queries run against them, if that makes sense. I think so. Um, a lot of good questions around DRA. Um, yeah, he said it makes sense. Very good. All right, guys. I, anything else, Adam, Brian, that you wanted to talk about or? No, I just want to say thank you again to Adam Prem for setting yeah. the system up and for joining us and uh, really excited about doing some, some more partner webinars like this. I think this is really helpful and valuable to the group. Hopefully everybody got uh, some value out of that as well. Yeah, I hope so. I'm going to stay on for another two or three minutes, but Adam, Brian, thanks so much. Um, where do we submit ideas? Um, we have something called, uh, it's an idea section here. Let me put that in the chat if you want to stay on, but um, I'll put that here in the chat shortly, Jerome. But Brian, everyone else, thank you so much for um, for helping out. Really, this is awesome. You know, I, I like the partner stuff. It's really, uh, I think, helpful. Yeah, this has been great for experience for me as well. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. And thanks again for the collaboration with Imperfect folks. This has been uh, very good. And I would, I would love to do this again. Yeah, and by the way, Adam, you'll be able to rewatch it later. <laughs> 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 All right, awesome. thanks everyone. Hopefully thanks, this is helpful to everyone. So was, CJ did say, thanks, this was a great idea or a new idea for him, so. Awesome, thanks everybody.